Just in case there is any doubt, the technical term for the status of the bill at present is that the bill is in limbo. That is the technical term advised to me by the clerks. I was fascinated to hear that the bill is in limbo because I think, theologically speaking, it was reported that Pope Benedict XVI abolished limbo. So I do wonder whether, whether the bill is not in the heaven that is having been passed, nor in the hell of having failed, but is in purgatory, where it is suffering the pains of those in purgatory. Um, there is the deadline of the 31st of October, and we on this side of the House are trying to meet that deadline by getting a deal through. The House has voted for that deal, but it seems to will the end, but not the means currently. The Honourable Gentleman raises the question of limbo and how that um, correlates with my right hon friend the Prime Minister's uh, reference to the bill being withdrawn. Well, the key thing to remember about limbo, Mr Speaker, is that in, to enter limbo you cannot still be alive, and therefore the bill is no longer a live bill. Yes. Oh, we are wallowing in the realms of metaphysical abstraction, as Burke would have said, and almost certainly did, albeit not in relation to this bill. <laughs> Very enjoyable. Finally, on the question of limbo, I rather thought you had to be pure of soul to get into it, so not many people are going to end up there. Mr Speaker, I think the original understanding of limbo, one that is no longer widely accepted, is that it was a place for the souls of the um, unbaptised and for those who died before salvation was brought to us at the point of the resurrection. Uh, but... I think the um, understanding now is that that is rather a narrow interpretation. Um, I think the issue of what motivates people to vote in this House is one that it is always very difficult to settle. I have always accepted that honourable and right honourable members in this House want what is best for their country, but think that there are different ways to do it. But you must draw conclusions, Mr Speaker, from people's actions. Yes. And I do not think it is unreasonable to conclude that people who voted against the second reading of this bill and against the programme motion are not the greatest admirers of the proposals towards Brexit. I don't want to be pedantic or to quibble, but we have had three and a half years. Somebody's got an important call. I'm sorry, it's interrupting um, uh, uh, personal business. Um, but that... We have had three and a half years going over all of this. We have had hours and hours of debate. We need to come to a conclusion. The deadline for the conclusion was set by the European Union. I'm sure the Right Honourable Lady will be called by Mr Speaker, if any she's patient, um, that we have had plenty of debate, but ultimately a decision needs to be made. I hate to be a pedant. But my recollection is that the souls of the upright and pure who preceded <laughs> salvation actually ended up in Dante's first circle. The events of this evening prove to us all that actually we're all much further down in hell already. <laughs> um, M M M M Mr Speaker, I'm very reluctant uh, to quibble with my right honourable friend, but Dante can not always be relied on for the theology of the Catholic Church. I don't know if he's a Harry Potter fan, but I am. And the great Hermione Granger, of course, in challenging times, used a, used a time turner. Can he work with all parties, especially those in Europe, to see how we can get this deal over the line as quickly as possible. Well, um, thank you, Mr Speaker. I suppose we could repeal the Act that put us on the um, uh, Gregorian rather than Julian calendar, which might buy us a few extra days. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. I can't hope to match the wit of Dante or the knowledge of Harry Potter, but if I could suggest that Monty Python could come in, that <laughs> the injury inflicted this evening was a mere flesh wound, and if the, if the Leader of the House was willing to bring forward a motion tomorrow with a more considered timetable for committee stage, Absolutely. it would pass this House. And just to correct the point that was made by the member for Shipley, who is no longer in his place, some of us voted for second reading precisely so we could get on to the next stage for more scrutiny and didn't support the programme motion because we did not believe there was sufficient time. There is clearly a goodwill in this House now to progress this bill to a point of conclusion, 
but yeah. to do so we oh. need the appropriate time and I would urge the Leader of the House to consider that this evening. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I am very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his point and for his very reasonable suggestion um, as to his own motives for voting. I quite understand that there is a conflict sometimes between wanting something to happen and feeling that the procedures for it are unduly truncated. Uh, I am a great believer that time in this House should be used for legislation. I think that is our primary purpose. And I rather like, I rather have a hankering for the 19th century timetabling when we were able to go on at considerable length and weren't reduced to four minute speeches. However, there is a pressing deadline of the 31st of October, and this is where I have parted company with the Honourable Gentleman because I feel it is very urgent to get it through uh, by then. Mr. Peter Bow. If I may say so, I think the accurate characterisation is that the bill is not dead, but it is inert. It is not on a journey, it is not progressing, it is not moving from one place to another. It is inert, or alternatively, it might be said to be static. But it is not a corpse. Is that adequate for the Honourable Gentleman? Right Honourable Gentleman's surmise is correct. Uh, well, I would say bless whoever that was. Ah, oh, it's the Honourable Lady. Yes, yes, bless you.